How's everybody doing this afternoon? It's a beautiful day for peace, freedom, and justice, right? Yeah, it is a beautiful day for that. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. So for those of you standing up in the back, go ahead and start making your way in, fill in, fill the seats. Nice happy family. So that's all about the community. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way. Uh, my name is John Bush, and I'll be your MC for tonight, for today, Master Ceremonies. Uh, the event's going to be going on until 4 p.m., and I definitely want you guys to stick around. We'll be serving lunch later. There's coffee over here to the side. Uh, we got a, a lineup of really good speakers I'll be chatting about here in a second, and I think it's going to be a, a monumental day that's really going to bring about some major change. We have t-shirts that we're selling, Peaceful Street Project t-shirts. They're definitely going to sell them out. All the proceeds will go to help uh, subsidize this project and our efforts. Also, cop blocks there in the back. That is don't grant extra rights. A wonderful activist movement all across the country. We centralize a lot of the problems with these accountability moments. And then they got some, uh, some swag and some, some bummer stickers as well. We're going to be giving out 100 video cameras later this afternoon. I know many people in the audience have signed up and uh, requested those. We've actually had more requests than we had video cameras. So we're going to give the cameras out on a first-come, first-served basis to those that have already uh, signed up in the past. We're going to try to get out as many as we can today. If you don't get one today, uh, we'll have your contact information and we'll be sure to uh, put me up in the future because this isn't going to end today. It's going to keep on going. So, uh, yeah, my name's John Bush. Uh, I've been an activist for about a decade now here in Austin. I've been in Austin born and raised. And, you know, we're all here today because we all agree that there's a problem. And uh, many, many people in the room have been victims of police abuse themselves. Raise your hand if you've been a victim of police abuse. And for those of you that didn't raise your hand, raise your hand if you know someone that you're close with that's been a victim of police abuse. So it's a problem that's deeply prevalent in society, and we don't get a pass here in Austin, even though Austin's a big, flashy, fancy pants, liberal, music, live music, music capital of the world. The hippie city. The hippie city, where everything's supposed to be peaceful and cheerful, right? Austin's weird, but Austin's not weird in the realm of uh, police abuse. It's just like all the other major cities. In many instances, it's worse. And, and it's prevalent. It's institutional. And that's how we formed the Peaceful Streets Project. Our goal is to end the institutionalized violence that's taking place in Austin streets. And it's an ambitious goal because this institutional violence has been prevalent uh, just about since the city's founding. And when I say institutionalized violence, I mean it, this is a special brand of violence. It's not your everyday violence. This is violence that is backed up by the institution of government. And therefore, it's different from normal violence and that it's seen as legitimate in the eyes of many Austinites, many Americans, many people across the world. It's legitimate violence, which means it's different, and it allows a certain class of people to have special rights and privileges, seemingly special rights and privileges that the rest of us aren't allowed to have. For example, if I were to walk up to you one evening this afternoon, and, uh, you know, give you a straight shot to the stomach, maybe pull out the baton and crack you in the back of the head because I asked you to ID yourself and you refused to do so. I would get arrested and, and thrown in jail and charged with assault. If a police officer were to do that, they'd call it, uh, you know, keeping the peace, ensuring officer safety. He was resisting me, couldn't answer my questions. I had to crack you in the back of the head. If I were to walk up to you with a gun, pointed at you and say, give me the contents of your wallet right now, it would be called theft. I'd be thrown in jail. If a police officer does it or a judge does it, it's called collecting a fine, right? It's called paying your debt to society, whatever that means. If I were to show up behind you in your vehicle, pull you over, come up to you with guns drawn, and proceed to take your car from you and leave you stranded on the side of the road, it would be called grand theft auto. But if a police officer does it, well, I had that same thing happen to me in uh, Muskogee County, Oklahoma. Driving through Muskogee County on my way to Kansas City to participate in a Liberty Conference up there. And I was pulled over by Muskogee County Sheriff's Department, who uh, must have been involved in some sort of uh, drug interdiction program. Because 
they were looking for trouble. They pulled us over because I was driving my fiance's uh, Ford Escape, which uh, is registered in Missouri, or at least it was registered in Missouri about three years ago. You see, Missouri requires people who own vehicles in their state or that are registered in their state to pay property tax on the car. So even though she had paid the car off, worked hard right out of college, uh, they were still trying to charge her about $500 a year. So naturally, they refused to pay the $500. But as a result, driving through Muskogee, Oklahoma, without tags, I was pulled over. The police officers came with their sidearms exposed, and under the threat of violence, they stole my car. They didn't see this theft, but I certainly saw this theft, and they left us sitting on the side of the road in the middle of the night with a whole trunk full of stuff that we were going to be selling this liberty conference. We had to walk up the road. It was a very unsafe situation. Uh, and I had an opportunity to tell a joke to uh, one of the sheriff's deputies there. These are classic uh, slack jaw Oklahoma folk. No offense to anybody from Oklahoma. But uh, they come up to the side of the door and they say, you know, I'm going to have you roll your window up before you bring your drug dog around. And I said, well, you know, if you guys have gone with the right to do that without any reasonable suspicion, you don't know, have any drugs with you. He said, here in Oklahoma, we man. And we were reporting him from inside. He looked into the camera and he said that. He gave us a So uh, they brought the drug dog out, the drug dog failed, pulled us out of the car, said they're going to get And of course, I'm not engaging in, you know, a nice little piece of discourse with these guys, letting them know how terrible they are, they're violating my rights, and I'm just decided to roach training. And I had the opportunity to tell a joke to one of the officers. So I say, hey, can I tell you a joke? He says, sure. I say, what's the difference between a highwayman, which is a typical highway robber, the difference between a highwayman and a law enforcement officer? He says, I don't know. And I said, well, at least when the highwayman steals your stuff and violates your rights, he doesn't tell you he's doing it for your own good, like the police do, right? They're violating the rights, they have these special privileges, and they claim to do it for our own good. Well, he didn't get the joke. So I'm just there's plenty to in the next five minutes. But it just demonstrates, again, there's two classes of people. There's those that commit crimes and get prosecuted, and there's those that commit crimes and get promoted. And I don't know what it is. I mean, is it the shiny badge that they wear that gives them these extra rights? If you ask me, there's a few factors that contribute to them having these extra rights and privileges in society. One of them is that people have given the institution of police and law enforcement in general, where sheriffs or the FBI, they've given them a monopoly, meaning they're the only ones that can use legitimate force and can initiate force against peaceful people, even when there's no victim. Someone's just cruising down the road and fails a signal. Someone's smoking marijuana, for example. Someone's giving someone a haircut and hasn't asked permission in the form of a license first. Violence is initiated against these people. And it's because we create these monopoly institutions that are called government. And some of these people subscribe to this idea that we should give up some of our rights in order to have protection and security. And when they give up their rights to have protection and security, they're given certain promises by the man, the government, the establishment, the city of Austin Incorporated, the state of Texas Incorporated, the United States of America Incorporated. They say, don't worry. You can give up some of your liberty for security. We'll keep you safe in the form of the police. But there's going to be certain checks and balances. Should some of these police that enjoy the monopoly on the legitimate use of force start to abuse the people? They say there's a system of checks and balances. In the city of Austin, they call that system of checks and balances one of the one of the aspects of it, the Office of the Police Monitor. So earlier, a lot of people raised their hand and said they've been abused. I've been abused by police myself. So you go to the police and you say, hey, you know, I was abused by one of your officers and I didn't much appreciate it. They say, well, we have a system in place that you can go to to file a grievance. It's called the Office of the Police Monitor. So you go to the Office of the Police Monitor and they found my complaint unfounded when an officer was lawfully arrested me and reported him. And they proceeded to harass my fiance and several other women in our movement of maybe a fake Facebook group and call himself an axe rod. We love you all, Mr. Uh, so I was armed. I went through the process. They found my complaint unfounded. Antonio Peeler, who's going to be speaking to us later, and who's played a large part in making the Peace of Streets Project effort a success, he went through the police monitor's internal process and also the internal affairs review. And they said that Officer Toborski and Snyder, who uh, unlawfully arrested him didn't violate any policy. You do a little bit of research and you come to find out the police monitor's office 
Uh, it was an improvement. Uh, it's actually codified in the police union contract. So it's easy to see why we find no justice within the police monitor's office, because it's actually an institution of the Austin Police Department itself, in the police union. So they say, well, don't worry, there's other mechanisms that you can have. There's other checks and balances and systems of accountability with the police. You can go to the Austin City Council, for example, and ask them. There are elected representatives. They represent us. Well, you go to the Austin City Council, you find that the mayor has received tens of thousands of dollars of donations that were bundled by the Austin Police Union. It's no wonder they failed to act when officers murdered unarmed young youth on the east side of town. It's because they're getting tens of thousands of dollars from this police. Then you say, well, we have a district attorney, right? A district attorney, they can file charges. They can call it murder, manslaughter, a police officer kills an unarmed child. Well, no, the district attorney is just as corrupt as the city council, just as corrupt as the internal affairs of the Austin police. And so it goes on and on and on. And we found that when you attempt to find justice or accountability by asking your masters to let up a little bit, it often gets, it often goes on, it falls upon deaf ears. Because you can't ask the very institution that's abusing you to stop abusing you and expect them to hold themselves accountable. It's like expecting a fourth grader to break their test honestly every single time. They're there to look out for one another. They're there to protect their institution. They're there to protect the status quo. They're not there to protect and serve you and I. And we've done it. We've gone through the political channels. We've tried to change the legislature. We've tried at the city council level. That's not to say that there isn't value in utilizing the political system in order to bring about accountability. The Peace of Streets Project is trying something different. We're trying something new. We're taking it straight to the people. We're engaging in direct action. We're encouraging people to stand up for their rights without being dependent on the system to protect them. We're encouraging people to protect themselves. And more importantly, we're encouraging people to protect each other. And that's why we've gathered here today. The Peaceful Streets Project is a direct action movement. We're bypassing the political channels that have failed us time and time again. We're taking it straight to the streets. And what we've done with the Peaceful Streets Project is we've held over half a dozen Know Your Rights trainings through Austin, where we go straight to the people, we educate them about what their rights are, and we empower them to stand up for their rights should they engage in police interactions. Additionally, we've shown up to high crime areas and outside the courts. And we've gone on record, we've gotten the people that have been victims of police abuse, we'll put them on the record, we're sharing it via YouTube. Also, we're working with the Lone Star Liberty Bell messaging alert system. I'm passing on parts to everybody. I'll be chatting about that a little more in detail later. But essentially, you call the number, everybody that's subscribed, they get a message should you come into abuse. And the idea is that they'll show up and number A and help you out. And finally, we held this Police Accountability Summit. Today is going to be the first annual Police Accountability Summit. I want to thank everybody in the room for being a part of it. Of course, at the end of the event, we're going to be handing out 100 video cameras. 100 video cameras to activists who are dedicated to filming police interactions. Should they come under fire from police, or should some of their fellow community members come under fire? The idea is to plant seeds. The video cameras can be seen seeds that are being implanted deep in the community to grow trees of accountability. We're seeking to change the culture, not change the law, not change the ordinance, not change who the police chief is or change who the mayor is. We're trying to change the culture. The culture within the people for them to understand that they are inherently free. And the culture within the police to understand and recognize that freedom that we all enjoy and to respect it. Because no matter what the Bill of Rights say, no matter what the city of Oregon says, no matter what the laws against murder say, if the institutions of violence don't respect those rights, then they might as well not be there written down on paper. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get everybody to stand up for themselves, stand up for each other, and we have a wonderful program that's hopefully going to inspire and empower you guys in the room, you guys that are going to be watching this on video. We're going to be hearing from Renee Valdez of Resistencia, we're going to hear from Michael Cargill, who's a self-defense instructor. We're going to hear from Clyde Volunteers, who came in from, uh, I don't know where he's from, but not from Texas, it's from. And our different Pete Volunteers there is going to speak as well with CopBlock.org. We're also going to hear from some folks from the Texas Civil Rights Project, which has done a whole lot of work to help uh, those disempowered communities to stand up for their rights. We're going to hear from Harold Gray during the breakout session. He's a wonderful activist with the Peace of Streets Project. 
And those that have seen cameras are going to be required to take this training on filming police and knowing their rights in those situations. Uh, we're also going to hear from Paul Hernandez, who's a dedicated East Austin activist, founder of the local Brown Parade chapter. We're going to, it's going to be easy to hear via video, as well as Robert King, who's a former Black Panther member and who spent a lot of time, decades, in prison in solitary confinement because he had the bravery to stand up to the system. Finally, we're, going to hear, we're also going to hear from Wayne Krause Yang uh, and Jim Harrington, the Texas Civil Rights Project. And finally, Antonio Wheeler, who inspired this movement, is going to stand up and uh, speak to you guys. And then we're going to hand out those 100 video cameras. We're going to be serving lunch. I know it's going to be a long day. I want you guys to stick around with us the whole time. There's going to be video. There's going to be music. Wait, there might not be music. <laughs> There's a new video. Uh, it's going to be fun. We want to want you guys to network. If you've been a victim of police abuse and you're yet to take your story to us, come over here and see Comrade Josh. He's going to take your story down via video or audio. Additionally, if you have a smartphone and you don't yet have it equipped with an application that can allow you to report police or live stream your police interactions, go see Josh, Josh all day and he's going to hook you up and give you a one on one little lesson on how to fire all that stuff up. So essentially, that's what the Peace of Streets Project is all about. It's about protecting and serving each other. It's about not relying on the political institutions to do that. It's about standing up for what's right. And I want to thank you guys for coming out. We've got a wonderful program for you all. We're going to watch a short little video, and then we're going to hear from Renee Valdez, President of which is an institution that's been here in Austin for decades, and he's been fighting for Chicano rights, for individual rights, for people's rights for quite some time. We're going to hear from you shortly. The Peaceful Street Project in full effect! Yeah. And if you try to buy a land, then you got to get checked. Because the Peaceful Street Project's in full effect. Yeah.